Wait! Before you go, we have new Patreon stickers. Randomized leprechaun stickers available in the month of March. So sign up now, and one of these little leprechauns can be yours. Welcome back to the Papa Meat Channel. How you doing? How you doing? Come on in and sit on down because today we are talking about inventors completely destroyed by their own inventions. And what I mean by that is inventors who are killed by their own creations. A, a weird concept and a tragic one at that. You make something to give to the world and it's your ultimate demise. Very uh, Shakespearean in nature, but also very fascinating. And I think it trickles back to one of the first accounts that I think we all know and love, which is Icarus. Icarus is a Greek mythological tale about you flew too close to the sun and you get burned, right? They're in this prison cell, Icarus and his dad, who gives a <laughs> what his name is. They make wings out of feathers in their pillows and they're able to fly away. But Icarus flies too close to the sun, the glue melts and he falls to the sea and dies. <sighs> tragic. But to think that this could be conceptualized into real life and that this thing could happen to their real inventors is nothing short of awesome. <laughs> I mean, it really is. I'm not going into the list saying that all of these deaths are awesome because it's not. It's very tragic and sad, but the irony is pretty funny. We're just gonna look at some of the inventions. Maybe you have some of these inventions in your home. Well, maybe not. The first guy that we're talking about is Perilos of Athens. Dude died in 550 BCE. Don't think anybody has this gadget at home, but it's still fun to say needless, you know, whatever. Perilos of Athens was a sculptor and he made the brazen bowl as a way to execute criminals. Remember, we've talked about this, this part. The guy who sculpted the brazen bowl was inevitably put into it and killed him. That is insane. According to legend, Perilos was the first to be roasted in the brazen bowl. Not only did he, was he killed by it, he was the first. That is a bad turnaround for a commission. Well, imagine sculpting this and they're just like, all right, get on in there. It's like, nah, I'm okay. They're like, no, seriously, get get in the bowl. A bit boastful and proud while explaining the torture device's functions, Perlos thought he may receive an award for his invention. Instead, this angered and disgusted Ferilus, Valerius, Valerius, and he tricked Perlos inside the bowl. <laughs> That seems rude. Which, if you don't remember, they put a fire under the bronze bowl here, but there's like a trumpet inside of the chamber that goes up and through the mouth so people can hear the screams through the bowl. And the first person to ever do that was the guy who invented the fucking thing, who was so boastful about it too. He's like, no, seriously, the screams are loud as shit. It's awesome. Why did that anger him? Just too cocky? It sounded like the guy was just being arrogant. Be like, right, look at this cool torture device. He's like, I'm gonna get an award. People are gonna hate this thing. Give me money. Give me an award, please. Which which also, according to legend, after a body was charred, the scorched bones of the deceased supposedly shone like jewels and bracelets were made of the remains. Perlos was killed inside the burning of the bowl and his body was then thrown off a cliff. That seems a bit excessive. He was already burned inside a giant sculpture he made. I would have just like, I don't know, put him in a dumpster. Thrown off a cliff feels a bit overdramatic and that's probably a Greek tragedy. I doubt that happened. But I hope the guy actually did make it because that's fucking hilarious. On to the next one, which was Wan Hu, a 16th century Chinese official considered to be the world's first astronaut. Apparently, Hu is said to have attempted to launch himself into outer space in a chair with 47 rockets attached and with a kite in his hand. I love the optimism. That's like some Dr. Seuss levels of optimism. I feel like a lot of Dr. Seuss's creations, he's just like, well, you have, you've never even heard of one who, have you? Unfortunately, the rockets exploded. <laughs> He and his chair were never seen from again, and the crater Wan Hu on the far side of the moon is named after him. That's pretty insane. Not only is he considered the first astronaut, but also, I mean, like, jackass kind of thing. That's kind of like a jackass vibe, right? You have to give the guy credit for fucking putting 47 rockets, fireworks, basically, on the side of a... <laughs> on the side of a chair and just being like, I'll see you when I get back from Mars. And he like, and he just immediately goes up and explodes. Thank God there's never been any other recording of astronauts blowing up. Don't play that because we'll actually get in trouble. Today's video is sponsored by Fume. If you have an unhealthy habit that you're trying to solve, I think it's time to try Fume. Once you form a bad habit, it's hard to break. Let Fume fill the void in a natural, guilt-free way, and you can still get your fix. Just way healthier options. Fume's innovative, award-winning device is sleek, lightweight, and can help you kick your habit. Fume is completely natural and replaces vapor with flavored air. Instead of harmful chemicals, users can enjoy Fume's refreshing flavors, like crisp mint or sparkling grapefruit. Um, um, orange vanilla and raspberry lemon. Wow. Right away, you'll find that Fume's device is easy to use and it tastes surprisingly fresh. And for many people, using Fume device can also be a relaxing way to deal with anxiety and de-stress. 
Thank God for fume. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even pretty fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash papameat or scan the QR code and use code papameat to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. The Fume Solano launched last November and you can upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy the premium walnut barreled and onyx black coated mouthpiece that has a smoother finish and still get 10% off. That's tryfum.com and use code PAPAMEAT to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thank you, Fume, for sponsoring the video and back to the video. Next up, we have Lee C and the Five Punishments. These are fucking brutal names, dude. You know what's the problem is with this list so far, too, is that after this, the names aren't gonna, they're not gonna hold up. It's gonna be like Greg Jones. Greg Jones and the Spoon or something like that. Lee C and the Five Punishments in 208 BC. It's a great fucking picture, too. It's a really good picture. Motherfucker looks powerful. Li Si is credited as one of the most important figures in Chinese history. I don't know why, but that felt very dramatic. He was a chancellor of the ancient country for four decades. That's 40 years. Above all, Li Si is credited with pacifying China's enemies, both internal and external, by showing aggression in pivotal moments. He invented the brutal torture named the Five Punishments to instill some of that rule with a big stick mindset. In 208 BC, Li Si was charged with treason after trying to prevent Fu Su from becoming the next emperor, even though the recently deceased emperor Qin Si Hyung had chosen him. My God, the betrayal. The drama. The prestige. Let's read on. As punishment, Li Si was subjected to the Five Punishments. His his face was tattooed, his nose was cut off, his legs and feet were bound, hammered, and then amputated. His genitals were cut off, and finally, he was sliced in half at the waist. God damn. All because he's just like, that guy should be emperor over there. I heard him say it. But they're just like, five punishments! <laughs> like, I'm up just fucking immediately. He was chosen, and he's like, I, I, I was told by a pretty good guy that recently died, guys. Can we at least agree on that? And everyone's like, yeah. He said that I was supposed to be emperor. So they just take a butter knife and cut off his nose right there. My boy Lee C shouldn't, he didn't deserve that, dude. I can't even imagine somebody cutting off this boy's nose and, and his <laughs> balls and shit. And then he just cut him in half. Seems just all a bit excessive. But finally we get into the 1000s AD. And that's Ismail Ibn Hamad Al Jawari. I don't think I said that right. A Muslim Kazakh Turkic scholar, a lexicographer, and a writer. His magnum opus was an Arabic dictionary with over 40,000 entries, okay? The title translated to The Crown of Language and the Correct Arabic. Mm, that is my book. And he attempted to fly using two wooden wings and a rope. Now, let me tell you something. The year is 1010 when he died. Icarus story kind of new in relative terms. My boy should have just kept writing. It is possible he might have been experiencing delusions that he was a bird. That's a heavy piece of information. Do we know if he was completely psychotic or not? Also, who the fuck is writing this? It's it's 1010. What guy is like, by the way, I'm, he also thought he was a bird. And he's like writing that in a scroll and he's like, okay, pull that up and put that here. Someone's going to find that someday. So there you go. He leapt from a roof of a mosque in Nishapur and he fell to his death. Who let him up there? With giant weight. If this is an accurate drawing here, who let him up there? He must have been sane. He's, he had to have some kind of rationality to where he's just like, no, let me jump. And they're just like, we, I really think that's a bad idea. And he's like, Icarus who? And he just jumps off immediately and dies. All right, here we go. See, exactly. First boring name, dude. James Douglas, 1580. Huh. God, here we go. He was the first Earl of Morton, a Scottish aristocrat, and an inventor. In 1564, the city of Edinburgh invited inventors to present ideas for clean, efficient killing machines. That's a conference I wish I could go to. We just went to SHOT Show in Vegas, and that shit was uh, boring. Was the AVN more of a torture device? The AVN was more of a torture device, I will say. I have, there's a video of <laughs> my good friend, my dearest editor, my, my right-hand man on this channel, Nick, getting whipped at the AVNs. Maybe we can show a brief second of that. This cannot be the healthiest workplace environment video to have. That's gonna be in a court case later down in my life. Douglas brought the Maiden, an early type of guillotine that could cut off someone's head in one clean stroke. In 1580, Douglas was charged as an accessory to murder and was condemned to death. Who was surprised by that? James Douglas was a, a, he was a part of a murder? Well, he's an inventor of death machines. He's not a madman. And as a cruel joke, the main was used to behead and kill Douglas. That is kind of funny. This this is one of the times where I'm like, okay, the, the court was funny with that one. Fuck it. Use, use his own machine to do it. James Douglas is like, oh, oh, no. 
No, not my own machine. You think he talked to it? It's like laying there and he's like, don't do it, my love. Eyewitness accounts say the device worked rather well. Douglas was killed instantaneously. That's weird. I did, that is weird. I like how people are like, my God, he was a good inventor. Look at that. That was a clean cut. His body was buried in an unmarked grave, though his loose head was put on a spike outside the city gates and stayed there for 18 months. If I was going to get beheaded, I would want my head put up there. It's kind of cool. Except Game of Thrones taught me that people like throw shit at it. But you know, all, a lot of cool people were put in unmarked graves. Mozart, Mozart was in a was in an unmarked grave. The best musician to ever live, James Douglas. They're in hell just like you and I are one and the same. <laughs> Next up, we have Henry Winstonley, 1703. That is not an attractive man. This painting does not do him justice. Brown hair with a brown background and a brown gown. What the hell kind of color scheme was that? How would you put some goddamn color in it? Good Lord. He was an English painter and inventor. Winstonley designed and built the world's first offshore lighthouse. That's fucking sweet. He had grown tired of losing his ships at sea and sought to solve the problem. It took him three years to build. First off, what a crazy problem. How many ships did he lose? All these goddamn ships are getting lost. I'm going to put a building right in the ocean and we're going to make a big fire. It shoots out so people can't get lost. It's a pretty good idea. Do you think people probably, people probably made fun of him? Really, Henry? A castle on an island. You're so foolish. For five years, no ship was lost due to the lighthouse's help. All right, there you go. He was so proud of it and sure of its safety, he boasted that he could shelter inside it during the greatest storm there ever was. He took refuge in the lighthouse during the great storm of 1703, but the lighthouse was completely destroyed and instantly plus other five men that accompanied him were never found. That was kind of a dumb bet. Also, how did they know that there was going to be a big ass storm coming? The clouds just shifted and he's just like, fine, I'm going to camp overnight and I'm going to be fine. Didn't ah. happen. What if he was just like, I don't want to deal with boats anymore. I'm leaving. Puts a C4 at the bottom of his lighthouse and just blows. <laughs> Next up, we have Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier in 1785. I definitely didn't say that right. He was French. French, French, French. In 1783, Jean-Francois made the first untethered man balloon flight. Uh, this is, I know this is not going to end well. <laughs> In 1783, a man named John Francois did the first untethered man balloon flight. He made multiple successful flights and even took the skies in front of the French king, which made him a major celebrity in France and inspired others to want to come up with ways to fly longer distances. All right. I thought it was a one and done deal, but no, he's he's had his time. But tragically, in 1785, he made history again. Credited as the first known air crash fatality, Jean Francois crashed his invention, the Rosier balloon, on June 15th, 1785, while trying to cross the English. English Channel. Damn, fucking France to the English Channel. It's not like the longest thing, but by balloon? You have to have balls. Also, how weird would that look? As an upshot, the modern hot air balloon, which uses a combination of hot air and helium, is named the Rosier Balloon in his honor. It continues to be used today. How sweet. He was the first guy to do it and the first one to die. That is funny. Next up, we have Robert Cocking, 1837. And he was a 61-year-old British watercolor artist. And after seeing the first parachute jump in England in 1802, he felt inspired to approve on the design. A bit narcissistic. All right, there's your downfall. The parachute design used an inverted cone, 107 feet in circumference, connected by three hoops. Look at that. Robert Cocking in watercolor form. Who commissioned this watercolor? So he's flying and then we're going to see him. He's going to be dying. Here, he's, he's falling to earth. Great build on him though. My god. You know what kind of looks like is uh, the flying saucer in Up. Or, did I just say Up? <laughs> I meant nope. <laughs> He was not a professional scientist and had no parachuting experience. Attaboy, Cocking, attaboy. On July 24th, 1837, Cocking died testing his homemade parachute. He failed to include the weight of the parachute in his calculations, thus he fell too quickly. Oh, that is tragic. Cocking was instantly killed in the crash. Tests carried out by John Wise showed that Cocking's design would have worked if only it was better constructed and larger. That is tragic. You, someone had to have been there to see that, right? There was a crowd of people watching him and he's just like, here I go, and just like, after Cockin's death, parachuting became unpopular. Oh, really? And mostly seen in Carnival and Circus X until the late 19th century. I kind of think parachuting should still be unpopular. The fact that if you fold the parachute wrong, you're dead. Too much responsibility. Especially it's like families own that shit. Kids fold the things and put the backpacks in there. Isn't that weird? But of course, it's nothing compared to William Bullock in 1867. He was an American. He's one of us. Mr. Bullock's main invention was the web rotary press. It was a huge advancement to the publishing industry at the time in 1863. Its design was an improvement on Richard March Rowe's original press created 20 years earlier. The main difference was that this printing press self-adjusted and automatically loaded large amounts of paper into rollers. Ooh, baby. In 1867, Bullock was installing one for the Philadelphia Public Ledger newspaper when his leg got jammed in the machine. Oh, God. The injury he suffered there led to gangrene and Bullock died during his amputation operation. 
operation. Man, I'll tell you what. Getting a fucking leg amputated in the 1800s, especially in America, holy shit. Motherfuckers did not wash their hands back then, all right? Man, what a what a pathetic way to die, too. That's just so sad. Oh, got my leg jammed. And then it's like, <laughs> he's like, all right, that it hurts, it does. All right, I'm going to lose my leg. Okay. And he gets fucking gangrene. Absolutely brutal. We leave the 1800s with Otto Lilienthal in 1896. If this motherfucker dies from flying again, I'm going to... He was a... <laughs> He was a German inventor known as the Flying Man. That shit should have ended with, 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 uh, <laughs> the fucking C, uh, Wanu. He painstakingly studied the wings of a white stork as research for his invention designs. Created the first controllable glider. He had over 2,000 successful flights. No wonder he was labeled the Flying Man. Good Lord. In 1893, Otto flew for a record-breaking distance of 250 meters. And in 1896, while flying to break his own record, Lilenthal fell over 50 feet from the air to his death. Breaking his neck, he was rushed to the hospital where he died shortly after. And his famous last words were, Sacrifices must be made. That is fucking... Awesome. And with a broken neck, too. He's like, neck's all bent up, and he's like, Sacrifices must be made. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, shit. With his inventions and studies, he pioneered the aerodynamic phenomenon known as the heavier-than-air flight, which led to the conception of the fixed-winged aircraft. Unlike Icarus, Otto knew what he was doing, and he is widely remembered as the father of flight and is credited by the Wright brothers' main inspiration. This is probably the only positive one so far. Sacrifices must be made. Sacrifice. Unschensplach. It's me trying to speak German. In respect, of course. It doesn't matter. Franz Reichardt in 1912. I love that we're getting pictures now. This dude looks like a vampire hunter. That is a crisp photo for 1912. Known as the Flying Tailor. Here we go again. <laughs> Reichelt was testing a coat parachute he had designed. He fell to his death, <laughs> leaping from the deck of the Eiffel Tower. All right, that's kind of funny. His parachute seemed to have only opened halfway and folded around him immediately. He fell for a few seconds before striking the frozen soil at the foot of the tower, and it was reported that his right leg and arm were crushed, his skull and spine broken, and that he was bleeding from the mouth, nose, and ears. He was already dead by the time onlookers arrived. During an autopsy, it was concluded that Reichelt died of a heart attack during his fall. <laughs> that is insane. <laughs> He's like, ah, 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 ah. that is fucking insane. People are like, he's, it's beautiful. He would have just been like dead floating, which that would have been pretty sick too. Raikou was trying to create a way for pilots to survive a fall out of an aircraft. Raikou had promised the authorities that he would use a dummy, but at the last moment, he strapped himself into the garment and jumped off in front of a camera crew. To get wrapped up in that would suck. To have a heart attack and then plummet to your death also would be equally as tragic. But next up, we also have Thomas Andrews, 1912. I think a couple people might know who Thomas Andrews is because he was a British businessman and shipbuilder. He was the naval architect in charge of the plans for the Titanic. He was on the maiden voyage that hit the iceberg and sank. Andrews, along with 15 other passengers on board, died, and his body was never found. Supposedly, Andrews asked for another row of lifeboats to be installed. This was rejected. Had it not been, there would have been enough emergency accommodations to save every passenger and crew member on the ship, which I'm pretty sure he's in the movie. So just want to just put that in there. The actor who's in Legally Bond with Reese Witherspoon, it's her creepy old professor that wants to fuck Reese Witherspoon, and she rejects him, and she doesn't give them promotion, but it's okay because Luke Wilson, who's Owen Wilson's brother, comes in, he has a really bad haircut, and he finger fucks Reese Witherspoon later and gives her a job, and she wins. It's that actor. <laughs> Next up, Francis Edgar Stanley, 1918. He was an American businessman and co-founder of Stanley Motor Carriage Company. Dude, I missed the, just the phrase carriage. It's a motor carriage. He was in business with his twin brother, Freeland Oscar Stanley. And after selling their photography business for $500,000, they started a steam car manufacturing company. They founded in 1897 and built a car that same year, and it became a hit among with wealthy automobile enthusiasts. In 1906, their steam car, the Rocket, broke the land speed record, reaching the speed of 127 miles per hour which is what a 2006 Honda Civic could do today. But it is very impressive still for back then. Put up a picture of a car that can do that. We've come a long way. And in 1918, though, Francis was killed while driving a Stanley Steamer automobile. He drove his car into a wood pile after attempting to avoid farm wagons traveling side by side on the road. I started laughing there, but it was just because uh, it's kind of goofy. And I picture like old timey sounds like, ah, ah. And he's like, ah. <laughs> Get your wagons out of the way! What? Like with their horses? You think he's going 127? <laughs> I, I don't... <laughs> yeah. I bet you he was going 35 miles an hour and still he was like... Ah! Speed wobbles. No! Alexander Bogdanov, 1928. I feel like I've heard his name before. Russian polymath, revolutionary, and pioneer hematologist. Which a polymath is a person with a wide-ranging knowledge of many subjects. Wow, what a fucking... 
going to boast it. I know a lot of things about it over the course of many areas. We're going to call that a polymath. He was a physician, philosopher, science fiction writer, made advancements in blood transfusion, and made important contributions to cybernetics. Jesus Christ, dude. Was this fucking Tony Stark? Goddamn. Founded the first Institute of Blood Transfusion in 1926. Uh-oh. After carrying out an experimental blood transfusion between himself and 21-year-old student who had an inactive case of tuberculosis, Bogdanov believed the younger man's blood would rejuvenate his aging body. <laughs> Which... <laughs> Who does that sound like, right? Little YouTuber that's on YouTube right now? Little million dollar man? Is the YouTube vampire a polymath? Maybe. And that his own blood would help cure the student's disease. He believed his body was resistant to tuberculosis. <laughs> he died from an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. This is a serious complication during transfusions. The red blood cells that were given during the transfusion are destroyed by the person's immune system. Basically, he make blood transfusion tube and it kills him and he was a very important man who knew a lot of things in 1930 we get introduced to max valier he was a member of the 1920s german rocket society and valier was so enthralled with rockets potential how it could one day fuel astronauts to the moon he decided to showcase the power and awe to the public he wanted to excite the public and also draw funding for his own projects and research he fitted rail cars sleds gliders and most notably race cars with rockets for these public demonstrations that's awesome i would have been there you want to see a guy drive one of the steam automobiles Automobiles with a rocket attached, I'd be like, okay, it's 1930s. I have literally nothing else going on. I'm eating bread. <laughs> I'd say, sure, I'm just eating bread. I'll go with you. For Max, safety came secondary. What a badass. Valier wore no goggles and no fire retardant clothing. Instead of sitting behind a concrete wall looking through a small slit window, he sat right in front of the combustion chamber with his face fully exposed to the flame shooting upwards. There was very little prior research and no funding, so he was forced to rely on luck. He invented a liquid-fueled rocket engine, and on the 17th of May, 1930, his luck ran out. An alcohol-fueled engine exploded on his test bench in Berlin, causing a piece of shrapnel to pierce his pulmonary artery, and Max Valier died in 10 minutes. He was 35 years old. I laugh because I'm just imagining the slit in the wall and the flames coming through. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Making him one of the first casualties of the modern space age. That's not true. On who blew himself up with rockets on a fucking folding chair. Max was just kind of like, I guess I'll stand here. You know what I mean? I want to see Max Valier's rocket car. This is sick. That this kind of insight. I want to meet some guy like this, dude. Guy who's just like, I'm just gonna make this. He is kind of funny looking at driving. Looks like a big cock on the road. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Riding around. We have Marie Curie in 1934. God, she's hot. This one is indirect, but Polish French physicist and chemist Curie was a pioneer in researching radioactivity. She won Nobel Prizes for her work in physics and chemistry, making her the first woman to win the award. Not only that, she was the first person to win the award twice and is the only person to have the award in two different fields. She's a fucking badass. She's credited for discovering radioactive polonium. Also, for coining the term radioactivity. That's pretty fucking brutal. If you're the person who's just like, hey, it's called radioactivity, that's awesome. Though, for her efforts, it is believed her long exposure to radiation is what led to her death in 1934, technically of aplastic anemia, but because of the many devices she created. And in a way, even her death was a discovery because Curie herself never acknowledged the radioactivity's toll on her health. And after her, her daughter, and her son-in-law all died researching the same thing, it became more clear that the radiation was harmful to your health and could cause diseases. Which, you know, she died at 66 in 1934, so she's, you know, pretty long time for that kind of thing. Next up is Thomas Midley Jr., 1944. Jesus Christ, this fucking drawing is haunting. He was an American engineer and chemist who created two chemicals that did the most environmental damage, leaded gasoline, which released large quantities of lead into the atmosphere. This has been linked with neurological impairment and increased levels of violence, and Freon, a refrigerant that destroyed the ozone layer and caused greenhouse gas effects. All right, dude, my boy Thomas, he made some cool stuff, but they might have done some bad things, all right? He contracted poor at age 51, leaving him severely disabled. He devised an elaborate system of ropes and pulleys so that others could lift him from the bed, but he became entangled in the ropes one day and died of strangulation at 55. <laughs> yeah, 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 I figured. That's pretty funny that you would think that it was gonna be like he blew up from gas or something. It's like, no, he just like, he's like, I have an elaborate pulley system. And he just got strangled by it. That's fucking brutal. Next is Henry Smolinski from 1973. He's the creator of the AVE Mitsar, a flying vehicle that was half a Ford Pinto and half a Sensa Skymaster. During a test flight, the Mitsar's right wing detached mid-flight. The aircraft disintegrated after taking off and making a right turn. It was the sole product of the company he founded. The one thing he was supposed to sell disintegrated and it fucking blew up in his deal. I do want to see the flying Pinto here. That's insane. That is actually so sick. Oh, I would not get in that back seat. Oh, where are you going? How would you ever regulate flying vehicles like that? 
You know what I mean? It would be impossible. There you go. Carol Sukic, 1985. Canadian inventor, daredevil, and stuntman. He referred to himself as the last of the Niagara daredevils, and he invented a shock absorbent barrel. I know where this is going now. God damn. Sukic had already gone down Niagara Falls in the barrel and survived. This made him the eighth person to go down the Niagara Falls in a barrel at that time, and not all of them survived. He was just, he was just one of the lucky ones. But now, Sukic wanted to expand upon the stunt. He wanted to drop himself from 180 feet from the top of the Houston Astrodome and land in a pool of water, where he would emerge unscathed to truly prove his barrel was protecting him. It didn't go as planned, and the barrel hit the rim of the tank before making it to the water. Miraculously, Sukuk survived the impact, but died soon after. Here is Sukuk at the Astrodome. Oh, here he goes. Whee! Well, that's a bummer. That'd be pretty fucked up too, because you can't even see the, uh, you can't even see when you're falling. You know what I mean? Next up, we have probably one of the greatest legends to ever live, ever, on this earth. And that's Marvin Haymeyer in 2004. Marvin Haymeyer was an American automobile muffler repair shop owner and professional welder. He became disgruntled after multiple back and forth of zoning rights, sewage line discussions, and plans to build a concrete plant next to his shop. His anger continued to manifest. He modified a bulldozer with firearms and armor composed of cement and steel before embarking on the killdozer rampage as revenge against his his city, which was in Colorado, by the way. The Killdozer had three gun ports fitted for a 50 caliber rifle and a 308 caliber semi-automatic rifle and a 22 caliber rifle, all fitted with a half-inch steel plate. Haymeyer unalived himself after his vehicle became lodged inside the basement of a building he attempted to demolish. As Haymeyer had no way of exiting the Killdozer after sealing himself in, the authorities have speculated that the unaliving was an inherent feature of the vehicle's design. Once he tipped that lid shut, he knew he wasn't getting out. And inside the tank also had AC, three handguns, and enough food and water to last a week. The Killdozer Rampage did over $7 million in damages to the city. The attack lasted two hours and seven minutes, damaging 13 buildings, 11 of which were occupied until moments before their destruction. Many town records and archives were destroyed along with the town hall, though no one except Haymire was injured during the incident. The man was not having it, is all I gotta say. And in a way, you know what? He's like a bit of a vigilante. Only the people that fucked him over got their shit destroyed, all right? And to be fair, the 50 caliber gun was a bit excessive. Marv, I don't think anybody deserved to die, but I do think it's funny that he destroyed all their businesses. I just wanted to say that. Next up, we have Luis Jimenez from 2006. He was an American sculptor and graphic artist. Jimenez had a string of bad luck that eventually accumulated in his death. As a child, his eye was shot by a BB gun. Surgeries corrected his vision, but migraines later in life led him to get a glass eye. Jimenez was an art teacher at a junior high school and got into a car accident that left him temporarily paralyzed from the chest down. In his later years, he had a heart attack and required a hand surgery. But on June 13th, 2006, a large piece of his 32 foot high art piece, which was a blue Mustang, came loose, fell, severing an artery in his leg. The sculpture was later finished after his death and delivered to the Denver International Airport, which is like a really popular thing now, which is also associated with the Denver Airport having all kinds of weird stuff going on. And now even the blue Mustang itself is kind of like an art, it's, it's like an evil arbiter. We might do a video on the, the Denver Airport, but there's some freaky shit going on there. All right, just want to say that. Next up, we have Jim Heseldon, 2010. Mike. God, that picture is haunting. Good Lord. Although Hesedon was not the inventor of the Segway, he bought Segway Incorporated and he died while driving a Segway. So you have to, you have to throw him on this list, right? Hesedon was an English entrepreneur. He was a former coal miner and he became wealthy manufacturing the Hesco Bastion Barrier System. And on the morning of September 26, 2010, Hesedon was out on a walk with his dog and he reversed his Segway to let another dog walker pass and accidentally fell off a cliff. At the unfortunate time of his death, he was ranked inside the top 400 of the Sunday Times rich list with an estate worth of 340 million British pounds. He's out there on their little cliff retreat riding a Segway, and on the kindness of his heart, he backed off and backed off right of a cliff. Segways are not that fun to ride, too. I just want to put that out there. It's like riding a vacuum cleaner. That's what it feels like to me. And lastly, we have Stockton Rush from 2023. If you don't know this one, I don't know what, you must have not have had a phone, because Stockton Rush oversaw the design and construction of the Ocean Gate submersible Titan. The craft imploded during a dive to ironically visit the Titanic. That is extremely ironic. Ironic. That's also two people that have very similar deaths on this list, except one of them fucking imploded. <laughs> All right, at least Andrews didn't. I'm pretty sure his name was Andrews. At least he didn't implode. Many warned Rush of his flawed design and his mixing of materials, but he remained staunchly in his unregulated design. He said, and I quote, <clears throat> At some point, safety is just pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed. Don't get in your car. Don't do anything. End quote. That seems a bit unrealistic. Don't get out of bed. Pretty sure that just because you get out of your bed doesn't mean you're going to go to the bottom of the ocean and a goddamn Texas Instruments calculator that's going to implode on itself, all right? And, you know, it obviously didn't go 
very well and there's been i don't know a billion different videos of people <laughs> dissecting what it would be like to be in that fucking sarcophagus imploding it is absolutely sad but what does this list teach us one don't invent anything because your inventions will kill you number two if you know somebody who invented something and they want you to use it don't do that and number three if a guy tells you that he's gonna take you to see the titanic and everyone's like you really shouldn't go i really think that you probably shouldn't go and number four one who was the man if you have a folding chair and you strap 47 rockets to it and you have a kite and you think you're going to the moon that's awesome and also there's a literal crater on the moon that's named after him that's that's fucking metal there's a lot of good ones on here but too much flying stuff if you know anybody who's like into flying and they're not on a plane don't, don't get rid of them all right just want to say that's a bad friend you don't want that friend but with that that's the end of today's video and we will see you next time goodbye